caregivers are forever trying to solve a problem. And you never have enough tools in your toolbox, but you, you have to have enough that you can switch around because the same tool doesn't always work. Um, but, you know, I've found things like with, with Kate, um, sometimes she's just she's been confused or bored or whatever. And I'd give her a tour of the house and we'd just walk through our house and go through the living room and the dining room. And we've got a few pieces of furniture or had in the house we just left a few pieces of things that came from her family's home, uh, a portrait of her mother when she was 15 years old, a chandelier that came out of her parents' home, and little things like that. And, and I've played the equivalent of a docent since she can't remember them. I tell her, and this uh, is so-and-so, and I give her a little story. And of course, having done this a number of times, just like a docent at a museum, you begin to get a little patter <laughs> that goes with it and embellish a little bit. Uh, and those work great up to a point, and then they no longer really work. You had to rely on other things. So you have to have a bunch of other things in your toolbox. And fortunately, I've had a rich variety of things that have, have worked uh, in a lot of situations. Welcome to the All's Authors Podcast. We're so glad you found us. I'm Mary Ann Shuko, a registered nurse, author, and dementia daughter. Join me each week to listen to one of our more than 250 authors talk about their dementia journey, sharing intimate details and painfully obtained knowledge to help others currently on that path. We hope these stories offer you comfort and support as we strive to break the silence and stigma surrounding a dementia diagnosis. May one of our authors speak to your experience. Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the whole care network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice, and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Today's guest is Richard Creighton, who began his blog, Living with Alzheimer's, a real-time account of dementia caregiving, the day his wife Kate was diagnosed in 2011. His goal was to keep a record of their experience for their children. He and Kate had cared for family members together for 24 years, which included both his parents and his in-laws throughout various illnesses. Now he cares for her deep into dementia at home with the assistance of paid caregivers. Richard and Kate recently made a major life change, leaving their home of many years to start anew at a continuing care retirement community where they can age in place. Richard made this decision to make life easier for himself and for Kate and to make sure their children's responsibilities for their care would be minimal. He wanted a plan for an easy transition to the last chapter of their lives. In addition to his blog, which he writes under a pseudonym, Richard is also an All's Authors Associate, creating videos for our Dementia Caregiving During COVID video series. In this episode, we talk about making a residential move late in life their traumatic bout with COVID-19, how he keeps himself active and busy while caring for his wife at home, and what he's got in his caregiver toolbox that may also be helpful to other caregivers on the dementia journey. Hi, Richard. How are you? Welcome to the All Authors Podcast. Thank you very much, Mary Ann. Uh, the answer is uh, I am terrific as well. At, uh, I'm in my new uh, abode uh, I had lots of questions about what it would be like and how we would adapt. And uh, some of those questions have been answered immediately and favorably, I might add. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm really enthusiastic and optimistic about what lies, uh, lies ahead. But uh, it was a, a long journey since I made this decision um, two years ago next week, as a matter of fact, gave them the down payment uh, on this place. Uh, and I did it at the time, believing that by this time, Kate, it wouldn't matter to Kate whether we were moving or not. 
And as it turns out, that's been the case because uh, she's, she's taken this just like we were still at home. She's, there's been no difference for her uh, that I'm able to tell. But anyway, we're, we're adapting and looking forward to things. Well, that's good to hear. And I admire your courage for making a decision to start a new home because I know that for many people, that's the last thing in the world that they want to do, even if it's the right thing to do. So what were some of the things that came into your decision-making? Well, uh, my wife and I had cared for all four of our parents. In fact, this is my 32nd consecutive year of involvement in caregiving. Uh, it's been different for each one, but uh, I've played a role in decisions about where people live, doctors, medications, living at home, getting caregiving at home, all, all those things that, that go into it, uh, I've been involved in. And while we didn't have any major problems with any of our parents or my father's significant other who had vascular dementia, I felt a strong desire to do things differently with our own children. And I, I really felt I didn't want any surprises for them. Uh, about either our health or our situation and, and things that they might need to take care of. So I have wanted to make it, it easy for them, as easy as possible to take care of us in our senior years and to minimize what they'd have to do. And uh, about two and a half years ago, I began to think more seriously about what would happen to Kate if something happened to me. And she was totally dependent on me. And my, our daughter lives uh, two states away. Uh, our son is in Texas. They, you know, they could of course get here, but I might have something that needed to be done immediately. And I felt like I wanted to be in a position to, uh, oh, forgive me. There's one of those things. I'm, I'm gonna just turn this off if I can. Okay, there we go. Hope that's it. Sorry. Uh, at any rate, I, I was worried about what would happen to Kate, and I started thinking about options, uh, and I was specifically thinking about how we would live for the rest of our lives. And there are several local uh, retirement communities, uh, continuing care kinds of communities. The one I was most familiar with is the one we are in right now. I've known more people here. In fact, moving in, I think I know somewhere between 30 and 50 people who live here, uh, and I know people in 11 of the 80 apartments that are occupied right now. So it seemed a natural kind of thing to do and make an easy transition. And even then I, I talked with our children about it and uh, we discussed it and they were comfortable with it. And I went ahead and, and did it. And having made the down payment, one of the things I learned was I was considered already a member of the community. And that gave me access to all of the facilities on the campus. We could eat meals here. We didn't, but we could have had we chosen to do so. Uh, we could uh, take part, part in activities and whatever, and all the facilities, memory care, skilled nursing, rehab, what have you, we could do. Again, we haven't accessed any of those uh, to date, and now we're here, but it gave me a comfort level knowing we could address those problems if, if they arose. So this is um, what we out here call a life care place. Yes, it is. In fact, our son, who's in the elder care business, uh, just left uh, yesterday. And we were talking about what you call places like this, because one of the names that has been used uh, currently and still by a lot of people is continuing care retirement community. But right now, he tells me there is a new new uh, nomenclature coming along and this notion of a life care community or life care planned community is emerging and that uh, we'll likely see that term being used a lot uh, in the future. And he is, uh, by the way, then a life care plan manager. He helps people plan or work out problems and solve problems often working for the uh, children of seniors who live, say, in Minneapolis, but their the children live in Texas, and they're worried about parents and living arrangements and doctors, and et cetera. 
and he provides mm -hmm. uh, an intermediate step to help facilitate things, issues and places and things, et cetera, to be dealt with. That's great. I want how, there must be a lot of people that do that for a career, but I wonder how many people know to find them. You know, I think very few people know about that. And there, there is a, a rather large association, professional association of uh, life care managers. But uh, uh, very few people I have run into, and I haven't done any systematic uh, search, but, uh, you know, when I mentioned, when people ask about him and I tell them what he does, almost everybody I mention it to is surprised, but thinks, oh, there's a real need for that. I can see that, but I've never heard of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay, so you and Kate are um, in a new home. And um, I like to think of it as kind of a honeymoon phase because you're in a new place together and you probably have some new things. It's a whole new start, and that's very exciting. And you've written about that on your blog. Can you just tell us a little bit about the blog and what got you started on that? Well, certainly. Uh, and I mentioned that we were involved in caregiving for our parents, and Sarah's mother had vascular dementia. My mother had an undiagnosed form of dementia. Uh, my father's significant other had vascular dementia. And so we'd had all of these experiences. Plus her father had had a stroke and, and died shortly uh, after the stroke, several months later. In each case, we didn't know a lot that was going on, really. We, we were faced with trying to figure things out. And I, I in particular, my parents lived in the same city that we live in. And I was with them almost every day. I, I got dinner for them. I, I took them places on the weekend. I was around them a lot. My mother had dementia. But as I look back on it, my father said very little about her dementia. There were scattered things. But I really didn't know what he was going through and didn't have any idea, really, until I was caring for Kate. But even before dealing with Kate, when we got the diagnosis, and we got her diagnosis five or six years after we saw the first signs, uh, by the time of diagnosis, you know, we both were absolutely convinced. She was convinced from the very outset that she had Alzheimer's. I, of course, thought everybody has memory problems. But at any rate, I, I felt like I wanted our children to know the story. I wanted them to know what we were experiencing. Uh, and so I started a journal and I don't like to write. Uh, so it's a very um, uncharacteristic thing for me to choose to do, but I, I chose it. And I started the journal the very day of the diagnosis and described how we felt, how she felt, what we did, uh, our luncheon after we left the doctor's office and, and you know what we did during those first two weeks after and the planning we did. And so I captured all of this as we were going along and have to date captured it's now uh, over 10 years since that time. And I still do it though somewhat less regularly at the moment than I had been in the last couple of years, just because I've been busier. And that, and that's the real truth. It's not because there's less to talk about, but it, it was that motivation to have a record of our story. And, and specifically I was thinking about our children who may not have cared, I don't know, but I, I think it, uh, that they would. But uh, in time, I do know that other people share their stories with a broader public, uh, which I've done with the blog. And that's how I happened to start the blog. I said, well, I've got all this stuff and people people knew I was keeping a journal. They said, well, you ought, to, you ought to write a book about this would be the first thing I would say. And I would say, oh no, write a book. I, you know, it was enough to write a journal, but I, I don't think I could ever write a book. Um, blog sounded to me as though it might be easier because I could do little snippets at a time. And that's why I started the blog. And, and by the way, it has worked out beautifully for, for me. I mean, it, it's done a lot for me personally I have, in many ways. I mean, for, for example, it makes me more 
um, mindful of things that we're doing and, and I'm observing more carefully than I might otherwise have done uh, what is happening, how I react to it, how we're feeling, what the problems are, uh, and how well we're getting along. Uh, so I've, I've tried to capture all of these things. And I do it not because I think what we've done is a model that everyone else should do, because our circumstances are quite different from a lot of other people's, as are theirs from everyone else. So I, but I do know that we all can pick up things from uh, somebody else's experience. And if somebody can pick up something from what we've done, I'm delighted to do that. That wasn't my driving force and motivation for doing it in the first place. Okay, and how have readers responded to the blog? Well, I think they've responded uh, more, uh, how shall I say, more enthusiastically than I would have expected. And I, I think maybe what has struck me, I've taken a, a different perspective than some other writers have. It is, uh, it is no secret that there are lots of problems that caregivers uh, who are caring for people with dementia, that there are problems that people run out into, and you're always problem solving. It's just a, a lifetime of, of problem solving. But I have been struck by how many good things we've been able to do in the process. And so a lot of my focus has dealt with those good things. And I think there are some of the readers that, that have communicated with me have, have valued that approach. Although I must say, I've worried a bit about it because I feel a lot of the things that have happened to us are fortuitous, things that they, they're not a result of, uh, of my skillful planning or uh, great knowledge of caregiving or dementia. They are things that are just part of our circumstances that make it work. Um, and so, uh, but I think that comes, I hope some of that comes through in, in the reading. I, I worry about making people think, oh, gee, I wish my situation could be like that. I wish we could do that. Uh, but I think everybody has to deal with whatever your situation is and find within your world the things that make sense for you. Uh, and make the best of that, no matter what happens. I particularly, by the way, have felt that um, Twitter has been a very important part, and I think of Twitter and the blog as, as working together in uh, very complementary forms. And in that connection, I've developed lots of relationships with people that I, I'm learning a lot from them and their experiences, and they apparently are at least interested, if not learning something, from some of the things I do. So those are a few thoughts about my readers. A great bunch of folks, I might add. Oh yeah, for sure. I, I follow you, I, I read the blog and I follow you on Twitter and see um, you connecting with other people. And that's how Al's authors got started with Gene Lee and I meeting up on Twitter and, and starting a conversation that way. So. I know a lot of people, especially older people, might be a little hesitant about getting on social media, but you really can find friends and friendship. So I would encourage people to, to look at that and see if, if it might be something for them as a way to talk to other people that are going through what you're going through, even though you may not know them. But there's so much to learn from other people as a matter of fact, there's a group of authors who, um, they call themselves the Four Amigos, and they all have dementia. And they are on YouTube, and you can find them on um, Twitter as well. And they just talk about be having dementia and what it's like for them. And they're hysterical. They all live in England. They're really funny. And um, there's stuff like that going on. So even if you don't have time to sit and read or whatever, you might have 10 minutes when you have any coffee, maybe taking a coffee break to um, go on Twitter and, and see what's happening and, and make some connections. It'll certainly alleviate boredom. That's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and you know, everybody or many people at least 
distinguish uh, virtual kinds of connections and how they compare to face-to-face -face interaction. And, uh, and there, there clearly are differences, but you know, each one offers you something that you can't get. I mean, for example, you know, I'm, I'm very in active communication with a number of people in the United Kingdom. And, and so mm -hmm. I'm, I'm learning about things that they do and ways that they approach things and uh, some things that I never thought of before and just have established a connection that I, if for no other reason, the sheer pleasure and identification of having some common issues uh, that we share. Uh, and that wouldn't happen if I just stayed right here in town and walk, if I just limited myself to what I could do face-to-face. -face. So I have plenty of face-to-face -face, uh, contact, uh, more limited right now because both the pandemic and the fact that I'm, I'm caring for Kate, but I, I really value the connections that we have virtually. Uh, I mean, witness the kind of conversation we're having right now. Uh, that's yeah. an important conversation. You know, Jean Lee and I've never met, but she was, I, I think her book was the first one I read uh, by a caregiver. And I remember writing a review of her book and writing her a letter. Uh, and mm -hmm. I, I can't imagine, you know, and we've never, never met, but I feel very close to her and, and admire her and feel like she's, uh, you know, made a great contribution to my life. Uh, and that, that came about not through face-to-face -face interaction at all. So. No, not at all. I know that a lot of carers feel that they're alone and maybe amongst their family members and their friendships, their community, they might, they may be alone. Maybe there are other people having the situation who aren't speaking of it, which is very common. But then if you just reach out beyond that, you will find that there are, you know, thousands and millions of people really that are out there going through the same things that you might be going through. And you can now friendships that that wasn't possible even, you know, 20 or 30 years ago it wasn't even possible. Right. You know, it's funny you should mention that or timely that you should mention that. I was in a support group, virtual support group last week, mm -hmm. and the facilitator said, uh, you know, we're obviously open to talking about all the things we talk about usually, but um, I thought maybe you might want to, I'd be interested in hearing about loneliness and what your uh, experience has been in terms of loneliness. And uh, it, it struck me at that time, I haven't had a, a problem with loneliness uh, because I, I feel as though I've had, you know, lots of contacts with people and I've, I've got contacts with more people in more places than I ever have before. And most of them, well, almost entirely virtual. Now, I also am pretty active locally with uh, various groups. And a lot of that's been virtual, even though they're organizations that I'm, I'm a member of. Our contact these days is mostly virtual. And uh, yet all of those things have kept me in the loop so that I don't feel lonely. But I do know some others. In fact, I've got a, a friend who not, lives not too far from me who is, is lonely and uh, caring for his wife at home. Uh, but he just uh, hasn't been involved in anything. And that's, that's a tough thing to do without, without the support of other people. And that's what uh, I feel like I've, I've been fortunate to have a large network, or as I refer to it, you know, people say it takes a team to, you know, I'm pairing off the, uh, playing off the old notion of it takes a village. It takes a team, you know, you want all your team. I consider everybody I can run in contact with as part of my team. All the servers and restaurants, uh, all the people who helped me move, make this move the other day, uh, the caregivers who come here, uh, the people I bump into in the hallway as I'm headed to lunch. All of those people give me a sense of, of involvement, participation, a sense of community. And, and I think they help me. I, I think they keep me sustained through some what are really challenging times in caregiving. Amen. That's such a great um, attitude. And I'm so glad you shared that because I think people really need to hear that. Um, you mentioned the pandemic. 
And I know that you wrote about your experience with both you and your wife having COVID yourselves. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, certainly, certainly. That, uh, that happened just before Thanksgiving. And, uh, you know, I think starting at about May, some of the restaurants started loosening up their uh, policies well, that, through state regulations uh, here, at least. And uh, we had started going out a little bit more, but we didn't, we didn't go out as much, nearly as much. In fact, in the, the week or 10 days before we went out, there were only a few occasions where we were out in, in a public setting uh, at a restaurant and no other public settings at all. Uh, so somewhere along the line, uh, we picked up COVID. And it was very mild in terms of a physical illness, very mild for me especially, most, and maybe it's not, I started to say mostly for Kate, that's not exactly true. What she had was a mild cough. That really, truly was mild. She had no fever, she had no shortness of breath, none of the other things except one that really was serious, weakness. It really made her weak. And that's what, uh, she couldn't get out of bed for three days, I couldn't get her out. And we went to the hospital well, we went, they called and am talked with her doctor, the ambulance came out. So two people with the ambulance service took her out of her bed. Now, mind you, at that time, she didn't know most of the time she was in her own house. So to have two strangers who pick her up, put her in a wheelchair, take her outside, put her on a cot, put her in an ambulance, uh, drive away with her. I can't be with her. She uh, goes to an emergency room where they do all sorts of testing and they, they send her to uh, x-ray and to try to figure out a room. They send her a room. She's transferred to another room and then a third room. She's there eight days. They change shifts every 12 hours. She can not get acquainted with the people. I'm not able to be with her any of that time. It was a traumatic mm. experience for her. So when she came home, for you. she was still frightened and she was already frightened of things before COVID. I mean, that's often people with dementia experience some of that, uh, like sudden noises. Uh, you know, if I had walked into a room and she didn't know I was coming, see, that might scare her. Uh, just getting ice out of the ice maker would scare her. I always have to tell her about that. But, but this experience with COVID was a whole new experience uh, and it just traumatized her. So I guess I would, I would describe it this way. When she was home, the bed was her comfort zone. She was secure there. So she didn't want to get out of bed. And, and it was seven weeks before we, well, we, we got her out one for about 45 minutes the day after she got home. But after that, she was in bed seven weeks before we were to get her out. Uh, even now we get her up only about four to five times a week. Uh, and that means she's in bed so much that we have to change her and take care of other things while she's in bed. Everything we have to do to physically move her is a threat to her because she doesn't understand what that is and why. So she has been uh, combative at that. And uh, she's gotten better, certainly, since Thanksgiving. She really has. But she still feels a threat when we do things for her or to her. And uh, it's made a, a rough go. So it has changed our world. We had eaten out. <laughs> Eating out is another thing. We, that's a separate topic I could tell you about. But we, we ate out for lunch and dinner uh, every day for uh, over eight years. Uh, that adds up to more than 6,000 times we had eaten out in that period of time before the pandemic hit. And then bang, all of a sudden we were at home. So sheltering really affected her because Eating out provided a lot of stimulation for her. And it was the kind of stimulation that she could take. It didn't involve extended periods with somebody to sit for an hour at lunch. You know, a server's with you in and out, but we'd chat briefly, or you'd, you'd see friends that you know who were there. Hi, hello, how are you? Good to see you. I haven't seen you in a while. All those kind of things were brief, short things, but there, there's a bit of stimulation. And so she was active. We were going out every day, I mean, twice a day. That, that gave her some activity and um, there was a sense of, of just involvement in the community. And now there was nothing to that. The first thing that happened is that I had to be, uh, I had to entertain her more. I had to spend more time 
trying to uh, give her things to do because she, she wasn't in a position to do a lot of self-motivated things. Although when the pandemic hit, she, before it hit, for several years, she had done jigsaw puzzles on her iPad. That was, I mean, she did that from six to eight hours a day. She was not, she was forgetting how to use the iPad just before the pandemic started. And the, the first week or two of sheltering, she lost that ability altogether. So she lost the iPad and that was the last self-initiated activity she could participate in. So everything depended on my giving her something to, to do. Uh, and despite my efforts to do that, there were some times when she was then left to her own. And that led to her resting more. So she was resting more during the day, in and out of sleep. And when she would do that, she would begin to have delusions. And so she would come out of that little rest thinking she was someplace else or talking to somebody else. And there were just lots of things like that. And by the way, we got along with that pretty well because sometimes we had great conversations. I would just play right into the delusions and even do to this day. I mean, we have some 45 minute hour long uh, conversations in which I, I don't understand exactly what she's talking about or who she's talking about, but we, we were able to converse and she's happy and I'm happy about that if she's happy. So, uh, but anyway, that's, that the delusions really increased when she had less to do. It made me think about people who are in senior facilities. Uh, they have activities, people who come in and do things, a singing group that comes in and sings. There are all sorts of intermittent things, but there's a lot of time that people are left to their own, just like Sarah found herself at home. Now, I think it may have been less time than in a facility, but nonetheless, I couldn't be doing something for all the time. So she began to decline more during that period of time. And that uh, has just increased sig significantly. And uh, so COVID has had a, an abrupt and significant change in our lives, our whole pattern. So we, we did get back to eating out a little bit, but there are a lot of other things we don't do as much. We're certainly not as socially active just because no one is today. What state are you in? <laughs> uh, <laughs> I actually live in South Carolina uh, and in Columbia, South Carolina. In, in my blog, I, I'm in Tennessee in Knoxville, but I actually live in Columbia, South Carolina. So you gave yourself away here, revealing your two different locations, one real life and one on the blog. You've been writing and as Richard Creighton using a pseudonym. Yes, yes. I can understand why. Yes. A lot of people feel, you know, in the beginning stages that they don't want to uh, expose any, any personal information about their loved one that might be harmful to their dignity or, or their self-respect or anything like that. Um, you know, you read Jean Lee's book, so you, that was a, a big part of that in her story. But... Um, then as things progress or, you know, later on, the person feels a little more uh, at liberty, to, to be honest, to, to break through that. Because that's all part of the stigma of the disease. And what we're discovering is that when people are outspoken about it, it really changes things. We have in all's authors, so many authors who are living with the disease themselves, you know, being very frank about their difficulties and not being afraid to expose themselves if they're having a difficult, you know, problem. And um, it makes, it's, it's helpful for everybody really, because people who are also living with the disease can see others and also see people having a full life in spite of it, which is a big mythology because most people think when you get a dementia diagnosis that, that your life is over and your life is just different. It's not over. And this, you can still do things and, and be happy. And we need to make sure people understand that. You know, that's, that's something that was um, something I had to actually discovered myself. I, I think I was like most people in that regard. Uh, but we have really led full lives. Full doesn't mean we do all the same things, but we, we, 
-hmm. We really live full lives in the sense that we can appreciate and enjoy many different things and we enjoy life and each other. And I never imagined that that would be possible this far into the disease. And so that's a real happy discovery. And, and uh, you know, one of the, the most profound learnings I've had in this whole thing uh, comes from Judy Cornish and the Dawn Method. And that's her differentiation or distinction between the rational and intuitive thought as she refers to it. I, I tend to think of it as rational and intuitive, intuitive abilities. Uh, but uh, most people, when they think of dementia, really are thinking of the rational aspect of our brain and our abilities. And that's certainly important. It's, I mean, it's critically important to many, many things. But we don't stop and think how much of life can be enjoyed and appreciated by our senses or our intuitive nature. And without knowing anything about the Dawn, the Dawn Method and Judy's thoughts, Kate and I had binged on the senses. We had, music, for example, had been very important. Um, the eating out and the social contact, the, the kind of, that kind of thing was important because those kinds of experiences that we were having, uh, whether it was food or just the fun of being with, with friends, uh, all of those things. And then Beauty. She loved her plants and she worked in the yard for years until she killed most of them, uh, pruning them to death. But uh, she, she really loved her yard and she would spend as much as six hours a day in the yard, even in the hot summers. Um, but, uh, and, and then looking out, we had a lot of glass over uh, our family room. And, and you could look at our neighbors, fortunately, had 40 acres of forest behind us. <laughs> And so we could look out on this forest of trees and she used to just come out in the morning. She'd look and I'd say, oh, I just love the green. Just love the green. Or as we drove along, she'd see green trees and it, it, all of that. She, she just enjoyed. She was happy. And I was happy for her. Uh, and those are things that may seem trivial to, to some people, but they become really big things for us and brought us a tremendous amount of pleasure uh, over over our lifetime. So, and I, I won't go on to say much more about music, but music, we, you, music, we, we, even now, we have YouTube music on uh, every night, every night after dinner. And uh, there's so much different kinds of music. I mean, we'll have an opera night tonight. We'll have, we'll have oldies another night. We'll decide we want to look at a particular group. And well, it's, it's, we're going to do the secret from Australia. We'll just, we'll go through their songs or we'll, let's go back to Frank Sinatra or let's just everything. It's, it's there. And, and if we're tired of that, we just choose something else. And, but the music itself is good. And uh, even children's music. One time, Kate was, uh, she had awakened from having slept on, on the sofa in the family room and she was really disturbed about something, uh, had a delusion. And she was really disturbed and I was trying to calm her. And uh, I don't know what possessed me. Oh, I know I started to sing a song and it was a children's song. I can't even remember what it was. Uh, but that made me, I had my phone right there. And I picked up my phone and uh, did a search for children's songs. And I found an album uh, of 100 children's songs. And I just immediately streamed it. And then we spent the next 30 to 45 minutes singing all these old children's songs, that most of which we had sung as children ourselves. And here we were. She's lying there. I'm sitting uh, with her, um, just enjoying it. And she forgot all about whatever was troubling her. And she was just fine. Uh, so there are things like that that we've had repeated experiences with. Um, in fact, the very first occasion we ever had of using uh, music as, a, I would say, a therapeutic uh, technique, very early in her dementia, I was rushing her. I'm uh, a little bit of an OCD kind of person, and I'm very punctual. Uh, I like to be on time and a little bit early, uh, in fact. She doesn't, she's not as sensitive about time and definitely doesn't like to be too early. Uh, so we were getting ready to go to a concert, a symphony concert. 
and she was running late and I knew we needed to go. And so I pushed her too hard to get ready. And she had a panic attack. It's the first time I'd ever seen a panic attack at all. And certainly the first one she had ever had. Uh, and so then I was trying to calm her and she, we had a few minutes before leaving and maybe 10 minutes and she began to calm down, but she wasn't calm yet. So in the car, I played a CD of the second movement of the Brahms Violin Concerto, which is just over 10 minutes in length. And before we got to the uh, symphony hall, uh, she was calm. And that led to my then using not only the second movement of Brahms and the second uh, of the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto and also Mendelssohn that's uh, well known. All of well, those mm -hmm. are very soft, gentle, soothing pieces. And I use them a lot of times for calming effect and, and they, they work well. Then I've since used tons of other stuff for the same reason. So I often, uh, Marianne, talk about a uh, caregiver's toolbox. <laughs> and I mean by that, uh, caregivers are forever trying to solve a problem. And you never have enough tools in your toolbox, but you, you have to have enough that you can switch around because the same tool doesn't always work. Um, but, you know, I found things like with, with Kate, um, sometimes she's just she's been confused or bored or whatever. And I'd give her a tour of the house and we'd just walk through our house and go through the living room and the dining room. And we've got a few pieces of furniture or had in the house we just left a few pieces of things that came from her family's home, uh, a portrait of her mother when she was 15 years old, a chandelier that came out of her parents' home, and little things like that. And, and I've played the equivalent of a docent, since she can't remember them. I tell her, and this uh, is so-and-so, and I give her a little story. And of course, having done this a number of times, just like a docent in a museum, you begin to get a little patter <laughs> that goes with it and embellish a little bit. Uh, and those work great up to a point, and then they no longer really work. You had to rely on other things. So you have to have a bunch of other things in your toolbox. And fortunately, I've had a rich variety of things that have, have worked uh, in a lot of situations. That sounds very creative. And at the same time, these are also things that are readily available. That's not something you have to go out and buy they're not costly. You have TV, you have music, you have nature, you know, you, you have your house and what's in it. So those are really good tips because uh, yeah. some people might think they need to go out and spend money that they might not have or aren't, don't have things that are as accessible. But I think it's just a matter of being creative, your creative approach and how you're using it is the difference. That's a good point. So it, it goes back to something I said earlier. I'm, I'm not saying that a person should do specifically the things that we've done, but mm -hmm. there are things that are in their world that are interesting to one or both of them are the things that, so you have to just say, well, what is it I've got that I can work with? And it does call for some creativity, but often mm -hmm. there are things around that, that provide some value. Well, we've used, and this is, of course, a lot of people have done this, but photo books. Uh, in fact, her brother, Kate's brother, also has Alzheimer's, and he's, he's three years younger and three years behind her diagnosis. It's just parallel. Wow. Uh, and he put together a hundred almost 150-page photo book for her uh, that's a good bound, bound book that starts with her birth and goes right up till. Uh, let's see, two years ago this past April. And it's, it's the story of their lives together and our experiences and our children, grandchildren, they're all the things when we've gotten together. And that book we have used more than any other single one. Uh, really powerful book. I thank one and grateful to her brother for having done that. Saved us many a time. You, you're talking about all these methods that you use, you know, to, to care for Kate and to provide her with a, a pleasant day. What do you do for yourself as far as self-care? How do you take care of yourself? <laughs> well, I do a lot of things, as a matter of fact. <laughs> uh, I, I said that I'm not, um, I'm not lonely. 
And, and that's because I, I have been an active community volunteer for all of my adult life. Uh, I've been very active with United Way since 1984, continued, in fact, even during this period of time, we established a new seniors organization for United Way, focusing on people who are reaching retirement age and would no longer then be part of United Way. We created a new organization, which now has 600 people, 600 seniors. Yes, we were amazed at what we were able to put together. And I still serve on that searing committee, plus uh, two other committees for United Way that I do. Uh, until about, so let's see, three, three years ago this December, two or three years ago this December, was active in our church too and taught a class on Sunday. Uh, I gave that up two or three years ago, but that, that kept me active. I'm, I've been on the board of a, a health foundation here in town, and I still maintain contacts there and, and participate in one way or another. Uh, I'm an active Rotarian. Uh, in fact, I chair the committee that collects money for Alzheimer's research uh, there, and I've done that for over 10 years. Uh, and as I say, continue to be active in that. In fact, I've, uh, I've got 38 years perfect attendance. Uh, you know, in fact, I've never, since joining the club, I've never missed a meeting. Um, I, uh, you know, I'm forgetting other things immediately, but, I, but I'm, I'm involved in a number of different organizations. I've got two college friends that I have daily contact with uh, by email. I am not as big a participant right now, quite honestly. I haven't been able to keep up. Uh, but, you know, we often have had 20 to 30, 40 maybe emails in a day. Uh, not all mine, and mine are always the smaller number. But that kind of email contact. I also have a list of people that I call just to stay in touch. My father did this. My father was uh, really good about keeping in contact even when he wasn't getting out. And uh, I, I just called him. I've got a college professor who was a mentor of mine. Uh, I, he's 97 now and in a facility much like the one I'm in now. And I call him uh, once every month or six weeks and we chat. I've got a friend I grew up with in South Florida and uh, still keep up with and I call him. I've got a a friend I grew up with in uh, Florida who's a retired professor of political science and uh, at, from SMU, and I can keep up with him by phone. Uh, so I, I'm maintaining a lot of different contacts that way. In addition, I've always been, as an adult, and what even as a kid, active in uh, some kind of exercise. Uh, I've been a member of the Y, I don't know, 25 years or so. I, I am now, I'm going to drop out of that because I'm, I live next door to a wellness center on campus here, so I'll be going there. But uh, I, for a long time, I was going to the Y every day, and then I started walking. I wanted to do more. I wasn't going. I didn't go to the Y every day. I went there three days a week. But I started walking in the neighborhood the other days. That kept me going, and then uh, and I reached a point. Almost it would be three years ago in September that I no longer felt I could leave Kate alone at all when I walked the neighborhood. So I started walking in the house, which seems a really strange thing for a lot of people, but I walked the circuit, they went from our kitchen to the family room, to the entryway, to the, to the living room, to the dining room, and back to the kitchen. And I walked uh, up to 70 minutes, but I usually average between 60 and 65 minutes a day. And I did walk seven days a week. But along with that, I listen to books. So I, I subscribe to audible.com. And so I get my two books a month from them, which works up out about right for me in terms of what I can listen to, because it takes longer to listen to them. And particularly since I focus on just that hour. But I enjoy the reading. I enjoy the exercise. I, and it helps me in terms of my... Uh, I think my general, both psychological welfare and physical uh, welfare. I also um, do breathing exercises uh, and I'm very careful about uh, my, my breathing and exercise. I, I was developing a little lower back pain. I've got a set of exercises I developed myself based on some things that some people do. And 
I do that first thing in the morning when I get up before I do anything else. I do about 15 minutes of those and, and my lower back pain has gone away. Uh, so uh, I'm very active in doing things to keep myself going. Uh, in terms of diet, I'm pretty careful about my diet. Uh, in fact, I'm 30 pounds lighter than I was in high school at this point. I'm, I'm at a weight right now that I'm happy to, to be at. And quite honestly, now I'm trying to eat more to just maintain my weight. But um, I, I'm, I'm a careful eater too. I'm not gonna tell you I'm, I, I, I don't call myself a health nut or anything like that, but I am very sensitive to the healthful eating. I do a lot of things to take care. I do a lot of things to take care of myself. Well, I did, by the way, I, I started bringing in caregivers three years ago this past September. Uh, and I did that for four hours a day, three days a week. And I did that so that I could continue going to the Y and continue going to my rotary meeting and have some time for shopping for groceries and whatnot, and to meet friends for coffee someplace. So I did that as a, as a deliberate effort to take care of myself. So I, I feel like I am really sensitive about caring for myself. What do you wish people who have not encountered dementia in their lives knew about the disease? Well, I, I wish they knew that there are positive elements or aspects that are possible. And they may be possible in different ways, but that life is not over when you get the diagnosis of any form of dementia, uh, different forms create or present different kinds of problems for the person. There are clearly issues that you have to address, but there are other things that you can enjoy and, and, and do that will give you a fulfilled life. It is not over. And uh, my wife and I, but, but let's see, 2015 was our last international trip. We went to Switzerland and uh, that would be five years after her diagnosis, 10 years at least after the first signs of her uh, disease. Uh, we jumped off a mountain over in uh, Switzerland uh, and, um, you know, um, what am I trying to say? You know, glide down on a parachute, came down from the mountain on a parachute. And each of us did somersaults wow. fall in the air. Now, people wouldn't have expected somebody, uh, you know, and in that case, we were 75, uh, 75 years old with dementia, jumping off the, you know, not the top of the big mountain, but over Interlaken. But, you know, it was maybe 4,000 feet, something like that. And, you know, it was exciting. We had just great fun. And, you know, we, we took off and went to New Zealand, spent three weeks in New Zealand uh, doing different things. And we've just, we've been fortunate enough, not everybody can do that to start with, but we've been fortunate enough to do them. And, and, uh, but there are all many things. And we've, uh, one thing we would also say, I think, in our relationship in the marriage, I think we have been even closer together, brought together closer than we were even before. And we've had a good marriage. Uh, I tell you, really good marriage. But uh, we, I, and I think part of that uh, is because I really did focus on the time. And now we need to make the most of whatever quality time we have. And it turns out the quality time we had was longer than I expected. And, and even now when she's bedridden, there, there are little things that I, I take great pleasure in. When, when we change her, I often help the caregivers. And I, I get in bed with Kate. She's lying there. And I explain that the caregiver is going to, to change her and that we can help her out. We all we have to do is just be really calm and whatever. And I'm going to be right there with her. And then when it comes time for her to turn over on her side, then I ask her to put her arm around me and I'll put my arm around her. And I'll say, I'm gonna put my arm around you, you put your arm around me, let me give you a hug. And we'll just turn over. Now, I'm gonna to count to three, one, two, three, and we go over and she's on her side. And now that usually produces a scream on her, her part so she doesn't go willingly. But once turned, 
she'll rub my back and I'll rub her back. I'll tell her I love her. And she doesn't usually say she loves me in that case, but she is affectionately rubbing my back. And I have often said to her, you know, sweetheart, I love this because I could give you a hug. And, you know, I don't think we ever imagined 58 years ago when we got married that we'd be doing this one day. But here we are, and I'm glad we are. Those little moments that we have are special moments in the midst of something that can seem tragic or unpleasant or miserable or whatever. Our relationship is still strong through all of that. And a relationship can be strong can't always because there are other circumstances that make that different. But in our case, we're fortunate that to start with, I could retire when I did to take care of her. Many people can't, particularly those who are children of parents that need to care of and they have children they need to take care of. I could, I could retire. We've had long-term care insurance. So I haven't paid a dime for any of the caregivers that had come and I'm still not using all the time I could use. I could, you know, I'm using now just seven to eight hours a day. I could use almost 16 hours a day without it's costing me a penny, seven days a week in perpetuity. Our, our, because our, our particular form of it that they no longer sell, it doesn't have a time limit on it. So that could go forever. Beautiful. Um, Sarah and I are both, but well, we both are patient. We both are conflict avoiders. Neither one of us likes conflict. And over our married life, we've not fought. We haven't, we've never been angry and fought at all or anything. We've been different on a lot of things. And when that's happened, we've backed, each of us has backed away from it. A counselor would probably say, no, that's not good. You should be confronting this issue. But we would back away and let us cool off and everything seemed fine after that. In addition, each of us likes to please the other and it still happens. And many times when Kate screams at me or, or, or the caregiver when we're doing something, afterwards she'll either say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Or thank you. Yeah. You're so kind to do that. Those things just, you know, all those things together and probably a lot more are part of why we've been able to get along as well as we have. And I just wish that everyone were able to do that. I do think, however, that more people could make their lives better or less problematic by focusing on the things that your caregiver can do, and that is through the intuitive abilities and not the rational ones, which they just lose. And she, you might as well give up on that. You're not going to win. That makes sense. Well, thank you so much. It was lovely to meet you. And you've given us such wonderful insight. I'm sure the listeners are grateful for that. Is there anything... Any other message you want to leave us with? No, I think you've covered it beautifully today. And uh, I, uh, you know, I, I, I uh, didn't mean to talk so much, but uh, that's what I think I'm prone to do. That's what Kate tells me all the time. Uh, <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to be a part of, of the podcast. And uh, I, I hope that uh, it may be of some use to somebody else. Thanks again. Thank you for listening to Untangling Alzheimer's and Dementia, an Alz Authors podcast. For more details on this episode, please see the show notes. 
If you enjoyed the podcast, please leave a review and subscribe to it on whichever platform you use to listen to your favorite podcasts. For more information on Alls Authors, please visit allsauthors.com. While you're there, be sure to browse our online bookstore where you will find hundreds of carefully vetted books on Alzheimer's and dementia. You can also find us on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Please email your thoughts on the podcast to allsauthors at gmail.com. We are a 501c3 charitable organization, totally reliant on donations to do what we do. If our author's stories move you, please consider contributing to our cause. Remember, you are not alone. One can sing a lonely song, but we chose to form a choir and create harmony.